Hi, welcome to Figure Drawing Fundamentals. So over the next few sessions, I'd like to show you a system that I hope will help demystify and help you get a plan together as you approach figure drawing. Um, this class is primarily based at beginners, but I'm sure that um, people coming back to figure drawing or people simply looking for a new approach will find some things of value here. Um, I don't want to focus too heavily on anatomy to begin with. There are certain um, anat anatomical ideas that we do need to be um, considerate of, uh, and that will certainly help um, with our journey, but I do not want it to become the main focus, at least initially, as we move through the classes, we can look at anatomy in more depth and how it influences the, uh, the choices that we make. So I'd say let's get started. One thing I would say before we do, though, is that um, when you're practicing at home, um, try and stick with relatively simple poses, like standing poses from front, side, back, etc. And if you get into very complex poses with a lot of foreshortening, um, especially as a beginner, that can get quite overwhelming because there's just simply too many things to consider. So, as I said, try and keep the poses that you choose initially relatively simple. And then as you build your skill set, um, you can also build the complexity of the poses that you tackle. Okay, let's get started. The first thing I'm looking for is the relationship between the upper and the lower torso. The reason is that I'm looking for the largest forms of the body first. They're gonna tell me the most about the pose. Um, then I can get down into secondary ideas and um, some of the more subtle ideas, but the relationship between the upper and the lower torso um, for me is the most important thing, especially with a standing pose. Um, so I'm just blocking in the upper torso, the lower torso, in their simplest ideas, um, in this case a box. So I'm just going to very likely get in a center line. And the reason I do this is I want to be able to measure correctly between the left and the right side of the body. Having a center line also helps me understand the axis, how much the body is turned in space. So it's a very useful tool. And you can find the center line by looking for the sternum or the navel. Um, these are useful visual cues onto where the center line is. Okay, so I've got my upper and my lower torso. And the third thing I want to find, and the thing that I, I, is really important for me to understand, is if there, if there is a supporting leg. And if so, where is it? So this leg might be coming down this way, down to about here. And um, notice how this supporting leg is sitting underneath the upper and the lower torso. Um, this is because this supporting leg is obviously supporting the weight of those. So I really do want to find, to see if it's under the center of the form and locate that, something like that. Um, the supporting leg's also doing something else. The supporting leg comes up this way, and let's say this leg is coming across this way, like this, something like that. Well, the supporting leg is making the pelvis tilt in this direction. And consequently, the rib cage is counterbalancing for that and is um, going in the other direction. So understanding the supporting leg will help me understand the journey as we move up through the form as to how that supporting leg is affecting, for example, the lower and the upper torso. So that's another reason why the supporting leg is, is a really useful function. Now you might have a pose that doesn't have a supporting leg. We might have both legs coming out, um, both equally supporting the weight. You will find poses like that, but it's still one of the first things that I will look for. Okay, so got in my upper lower torso, I've got just lines indicating the direction of the legs. These lines aren't really serving any other purpose right now than to show direction and general proportion, okay? So just find generally where my head is sitting, something like so, and the arms. So this arm's coming down this way, something like this. And this arm is actually going behind the form and the forearm is showing itself like that. So at this point, I have 
all the major parts of the body down, right? We've got the head, something indicating the neck, the upper torso, the lower torso, the legs, and obviously the arms. We could subdivide these further and further as we get more into the complexity of the pose or the anatomy. But I want to find the simple ideas because it's at this point right here, very soon into the drawing, where I'll ask myself, okay, are my proportions generally correct? Are my hips wide enough? Is my rib cage wide enough or too narrow? All of these kind of questions I'll ask at this stage because it'll be much easier for me to make those adjustments now than waiting until I'm much further into the drawing and, you know, obviously it'll be much trickier to make those changes at that point. So the next things I'm looking for is I'm looking to take this drawing obviously to the next stage of complexity while still trying to keep things relatively simple. So what's the simplest idea for the rib cage? Well, I wanna find that, that arch of the rib cage coming down this way, something like this, the arch coming down here. This is where that center line that we put in before is really useful because obviously that's where the arch of the rib cage is gonna start for each direction coming down this way. And I'm just very loosely getting in what will be the second simplest form for the rib cage, which is obviously this egg shape. The first obviously being the box. Um, so I've got a very loose indication of my rib cage now. Coming down to the lower pelvis, or to the pelvis, um, the pelvis is a very complex uh, piece of anatomy, but I want to simplify it as much as possible. And I also want to be mindful of what part of the pelvis actually comes to the surface of the body. Well, we can obviously see the hip bone, right? Or the iliac crest. And that is kind of be coming down in this direction here. Same on this side. It's going to be coming down like so. And at the end of the iliac crest, there's this little bump that you should be quite visible on the model called the aces. Now, the reason the aces is so important is because that is the point where the pelvis turns and the form goes inside the body. So it's really the point of the pelvis where we stop seeing it on the outside of the form. Now, it's also the belt line. It's, um, it's where a pair of pants would hang right here. Um, so it's useful to understand where this is. Now, I usually draw a line between these two points of the aces because they help reinforce what is this axis. The axis of the shoulders are coming in this direction. The axis of the pelvis is coming in this direction. Um, this is giving us already, at this early stage, it's giving us rhythm and it's giving us dynamics. We have compression on this side, we have extension on this side, then we have compression on this side, and we have extension on this side kind of opposites each other. So what the upper form of the body is doing here, the lower um, half of the body is mirroring on this side. When we can bring visual interests like that, it's, um, it just helps bring our drawing further. So that's the kind of thing I'm looking for, the dynamics of the pose. What anatomical cues are helping me understand the relationships between these different parts of the body? Okay, so we found the aces. And from the aces, if I just come down very likely in this direction, almost to the bottom of this box for the um, lower torso, I can find the pubic bone. Pubic bone's gonna sit somewhere in there. Coming up the form to what's called the manubrium or the pit of the neck, that's a really important part of the body for me to find. The reason being is that the clavicles um, anchor to the manubrium. So, if I understand that the pit of the neck is roughly here, come down sternum here, maybe this arch is a little low, might be somewhere like that. But if I can understand where the clavicles are connected to the manubrium, it really helps me anchor the arms because the clavicles, also known as the collarbones, along with the scapula or the shoulder blades at the back, they really are what the arms are essentially attached to, and they help with the mechanics of the arms. So if an arm goes up, I want to understand that the clavicle and the scapula are moving in a case like this, but the rib cage isn't, right? So the reason that's important is I see some people that are just starting out, they'll see a pose that's like this. 
They tend to stretch the rib cage to accommodate for that. Whereas the, it, the rib cage is an independent piece of anatomy. So the clavicle column is what's connecting the arm to the upper torso, with, along with the shoulder blade. So this, is, this section here, the clavicles and the shoulder blades are what's called the shoulder girdle. And we can talk about that in more depth at a later date. But if I understand that, okay, so this clavicle is coming out this way. This one's coming very slightly in this direction. Then I now have something here to attach the upper arm to, right? So there's the humerus here. This is the head of the humerus, and it actually sits in a little pocket of the scapula that's coming from the back. So if our model was made of glass or was transparent, we could very likely see the scapula coming up in, in something like this. Now I want to connect the upper torso and the lower torso together, and that is achieved by a muscle called the obliques. And the obliques run down the upper torso and they attach to the iliac crest um, of the pelvis. So with that in mind, I know that if I can come down the form like this and I can connect these two, well, I'm using that knowledge of where the hip bone is to attach that oblique, which is obviously attached at that point. Same coming down this way, coming down and then attaching. There's a very good chance that the muscle or the um, fat pad, especially on a male, will protrude slightly here. So it's probably going to have a longer appearance on this side, more stretched out appearance than on this side where it's a little bit more compressed. Okay, so let's look down at the legs. The simplest form I can come up with for the upper leg would be a tapered cylinder. So I'm just going to run that simple idea down this way, something like this. Now this leg is coming towards me, just ever so slightly, but what that's doing is creating something called foreshortening. So let's have a look at this here for a second. So we have the tapered cylinder of the upper leg, like this one, going straight down, something like that. Because this one is coming towards me, imagine that this pencil is the, um, the upper leg. So this is now coming towards me. So now suddenly we can see the bottom of the pencil. So if we do draw that in tapered cylinder terms, this cylinder here is going to suddenly be doing something like this. And we can see that underside plane here. Now we can see that here. I like to understand how these forms are moving in space. If something's coming towards me, um, what I found is a useful mechanism is to imagine that my model is wearing striped um, leggings, for example. If that same leg was here, or those same stripes were coming around the form, they'd be going around the form like this, right? Something like that. Um, I might want to indicate that actually on my drawing, very likely. It will, it will most likely not be seen um, when the drawing is finished. But I might want to understand, okay, well, this leg's actually coming towards me. This leg is kind of going straight down. But and where would that end be if we, if we just made that same cut that we see here? Well, it'd probably be somewhere here like this, and it would be a little bit higher than where this knee is here. Um, because obviously it's gone from that to that. So we'll talk about foreshortening in more depth um, at a later stage, but I want you to understand the basic ideas of it because even if you're um, working with very straightforward standing poses, you're inevitably going to come across very mild foreshortening at the very least. And you may have a case of where it's a very normal standing pose, but an arm is coming out like so, in which case, if you understand foreshortening 
even the basic concepts, then you can start to think about it in those terms and you can start to apply it to your work. Okay, so um, a little thing about measurement, um, and I'll talk about proportion in a minute, but imagine your upper torso is here in our simple box idea, and the lower torso is here, something like this. Um, a pretty much universal form of measurement that you can count on unless a model is in very, very heavy, right? But on your average model, you can count on the, um, the navel being halfway between the bottom of the rib cage and the top of the, um, the lower torso. In this case, where the, we would see the uh, iliac crest coming around the form, the very top of it there, obviously coming down to that point of the asus that we talked about here and here. Um, but this is where we'll find the navel, halfway between here and here. So with that in mind, the top of my box is here, the bottom of this box for the upper torso is here. If I come down, I can find my navel in there. Now, in the same way I have here, I've followed these lines around the form. I like to do the same with other parts of anatomy too. So for example, if our model had um, the stomach was coming out slightly here, I might find it useful to actually indicate that. Something like this, and then coming down, and then coming down to the pubic bone. Notice how that starts to give volume and mass to the, the whole abdominal area. Just with one line, I'm indicating how the form is turning in space. So it's very useful for me, especially when I get to light and tone, to understand where that turn of form is. So, for example, in this area here, the light could hit it, but then as the form turns just from about this point, I know that things are gonna start going into shadow down here, and then possibly back into light in this area, and then as the form turns again, back into shadow. So I'm thinking volumetrically, I'm thinking more like a sculptor really. Um, I'm, and I'm trying to imagine what these um, three-dimensional forms look like on a two-dimensional surface, okay? So we've still worked in relatively simple um, form, with, with relatively simple forms. And I like to jump back and forth between a very simple form like our tapered cylinder, or sometimes if I feel more confident about the subject, I might jump straight to a more anatomical approach, which is, has a bit more looseness and sometimes a bit more life with it. So for example, down here, I might say, okay, well, I know my calf is coming down here. And rather than just drawing another cylinder, it might be useful to try and think more in anatomical terms. Um, so I've got the, the, the shin bone coming down this way, and maybe I've got the inside of the calf doing something like this. So I jump back and forth, depending on what's most useful for me or what gets me where I want to go as quick as I can so I don't have to belabor over it. Okay, thinking about some of the, the, the muscles in the upper leg here, coming in the thigh, possibly a bit of a fat pad there, then coming down and then into the knee system. So, you know, we've got a plane that's coming around the form this way, coming down to the joint, that plane will actually tend to get a little flatter more box-like in this area, whereas here it tends to be a little softer and rounder. So I might just want to indicate that very loosely so that I can understand what the form would be when I come to light and tone. Now there's a muscle um, called the sartorius, which is actually the longest muscle in the body. And even at this basic stage of understanding anatomy, it is one that I think is useful to understand because it's a muscle that runs from the asis, attaches just at the asis, and it comes down this way, and it actually attaches on the side of the leg below the knee. Now, the reason I like to know about this particular um, muscle is because you may have observed that 
if I'm just drawing, going to draw my topography lines here, this tends to do something like this, and then it goes around and something like that. So this muscle pulling down here tends to create almost like a, a triangle effect on this side in here. And then we get more of the, the round uh, effect on the other side where the thigh is on this side. Same here. I may not even see it on the final drawing. I may obscure it somehow or at least at points. But what I've noticed in my experience, what I've noticed is you'll almost certainly see it at the top close to where it connects up here. And then it tends to reveal itself down here where it helps um, cut across the form this way. Okay, so it's just something to be mindful of. How do we connect the head to the upper torso? Well, you may have noticed I put this line in um, very early on. Why did I start with this line? This line actually indicates a bit of anatomy. There's a muscle that attaches at the manubrium here and it goes up and attaches behind the ear. I'm, I'm sure you've all seen it. Now, the reason I like to find that as a rhythmical idea first is because it attaches to the center of the body. Look at the way that neckline comes all the way through the center line and comes down this way. It helps extend the rhythmical idea. If I just start with a cylinder with a ping pong ball on top, um, we lose, the, we lose the rhythm, and especially at the early stage of the drawing, I want to try and maintain the rhythm as much as possible. Now, it won't always be convenient to find this in a very simple way, but once again, you won't always have a supporting leg. But if you see this as an idea, for me, I found it very useful to help, as I said, maintain the rhythm throughout a drawing and help tie in that whole idea. So if you look at this, we have a huge rhythmical kind of S shape going on. Um, these are some of the things that I think just help make um, a, a figure drawing um, good. So that's why I use it. Um, so, but anyway, we want to take that one step further now. So I actually think I'm gonna to need to bring this chin down a little because in actual fact, the ear is probably going to be sitting about here. So I want to know that my eye, where my eye line is very loosely and where the nose is, something like that. I'm not gonna get into too much detail in the head right now because we really want to focus on the figure drawing side of this and how these things connect. But might try and find the other side of that, the muscle on the other side doing the same thing, just very loosely, and just come down with a cylinder, just very, very subtly at this point. Now there's a muscle at the back of the head, um, connected back here to this little bump ridge at the back of the head called the trapezius. And the trapezius comes down this way, and it actually attaches to the clavicle and the scapula. Um, but it comes down like so. Actually, you'll see it at the front here as well, where it's connected. Um, that's something that I want to understand where that is and where it's come from and where it's going to. So I don't, I, even though I'm starting the line here and drawing it down, I want to understand that it actually, at the other side of the head, it's actually attached back here, maybe about here, coming down this way and attaching down towards the deltoid. Moving forward, about two thirds of the way along the clavicle is where the deltoid starts. The shoulder muscle comes in this way, something like this. And it attaches all the way around the deltoid, attaches at the front, the middle, and at the back to the scapula. So once again, understanding a little a bit about anatomy really helps me make some informed choices. Might have the bicep coming down this way, tricep on this side, it's gonna be the joint of the elbow in here. Um, and then I'm gonna be thinking about forearm coming down here. And then the 
hand is down here, something like this. We'll come back to that in a little while. Um, on this side, we might see the shoulder in here, but if this arm is going back this way, um, that may be all that we see of it, at least for right now. Um, let's just talk about the pectoral muscle quickly. The pectoral muscle attaches to the front of the rib cage, and then it actually attaches to the humerus right about here. Now, one thing to keep in mind is if the arm goes back like this, you see this cut right across here. That is the pectoral muscle that's cutting across the form. And that's why you tend to get that division between the upper arm and the uh, upper torso with the pectoral muscle cutting across. So we will talk about that more um, at a later time. But for now, just understand that's the case. Um, the pectoral muscle is sitting and attached just above the arch of the rib cage. So if I understand, if my rib cage is here, say something like that, and I understand that this pectoral muscle attaches across here, and I understand that it attaches to the humerus, well then at the point where it no longer is attached to, or at the front of the rib cage, that muscle comes across and attaches up here. It also attaches from this point here and comes across something like that. And on this side, it's going to be doing something like that. Okay. Now on a female, there's a very good chance we can't see the lower part of the pectoral muscle um, because the breasts will be in the way. Um, but for us to one, it's useful for us to understand it's there. Um, so now when I attach the, the breasts in here, typically speaking, the breasts will hang lower than the bottom of the pectoral muscle. So I can just generally get in a volume in here for where the breast would be, something like this. And what I like to do is I like to try and find the overall volume of this breast, not just the abstract shape of comes from here, comes down and the bottom kind of surface where it turns and attaches to the rib cage. But I like to find the whole idea. And if you look closely at a model, you'll actually notice a light change. Um, for example, depending on where our light is, but let's say it's coming from this direction. Well, the light might be brighter here, ever so slightly, than in this area here, because as that form turns, um, and it turns from the chest to the breast, that there's a good chance, once again, depending on the light direction, that that, that plane change will pick up light. Once again, useful to understand um, once I get to the light and tone stage. So I'm trying to think about volume and mass and not just line and shape. There's a place for line and shape, but I'm trying to think about volume first. Then I can think about all the subtleties of design when I get to the next stage of the drawing. So just thinking about the anatomy of the, lower, of the upper leg here, just very loosely, we're not getting into a detailed um, anatomical description. We're keeping things as simple as we can for right now. Maybe this calf, it's coming down in this direction, something like this. Um, got the, the lower leg coming in here, something like that. So it would be approximately at this stage, I will ask myself, okay, do I have everything roughly where I want it? And I think at least for right now, everything's looking approximately correct. Um, maybe this arm. Maybe we can just see a little bit of that kind of in there. Um, something like that. Notice the way that the upper arm here has gone behind the form, attaches here, the elbow's probably about here, 
and then this arm comes forward like so. So I want to be thinking in those terms. Um, okay, so everything is approximately where it should be. Um, and this is the stage I would go from what we've been drawing with until now, which is essentially a soft edge like this, where we want to start thinking about line like this. And that's one of the really useful things about holding the pencil like this, is it allows us to go from tone to line without changing the way that we're holding the pencil. Um, just gonna come down here from the where this edge of the rib cage is here, just coming down to the asis, kind of helps me find this general volume for the oblique in here. Same on this side, something like that. Not going to worry too much about um, the subtleties of that right now. Um, so now we have our abdominal wall in here. We have our obliques. Um, and once again, we're going from simple ideas and look at the way I'm subdividing and then subdividing again as the complexity level goes up. Now this pro whole process probably seems quite mechanical. Um, I think that it's kind of necessary at this stage, but you will notice if you go and look at, at some of the other videos, some of, some of the time-lapse videos, you'll get a sense of how I kind of abbreviate this process. And the more confident you get with drawing, the more you'll find that where you can or can't abbreviate something. Um, but even though I'm thinking in all these terms while I'm drawing, I may not in practice actually go to such methodical steps through each step because I'll intuitively know where something is or where it needs to be as I move on to the next step. So it might be useful to look at some of those examples and see how I'm taking liberties with this formula, okay? All right, so we have maybe a foot here, Maybe this foot's doing something like this. Um, the deltoid is actually going to be coming down a bit further here. But once again, that's an adjustment I could make at the next stage. Um, okay, so I'm, re I'm fairly satisfied with where we're at now. So now I'm going to go to the next stage. And once again, I may have done this much lighter than I've done it here or I may have abbreviated this stage somewhat in practice. Um, but the next stage for me is to go in and put more of a line where um, the final kind of statement of intent is going to be. And what I like to do when I'm doing this is I like to go through a checklist in my own mind. So I'm kind of thinking about what, it is, what am I drawing? And I kind of ask myself that as I'm going. So I might say, okay, well right now drawing the upper leg here, coming up to the oblique in here, and the oblique's coming this way, but now I'm gonna hit the rib cage, so I wanna be mindful of that volume. So that's coming this way, and I wanna think about that scapula that we talked about. So that's gonna be coming up there, something like that. And I do the same throughout the form. Oops. And I just kind of ask myself, what is it that I'm drawing? Okay, coming down, this is the thigh, coming down to the muscles of the upper leg, down to the knee system in here. Let's move across the form to here. Um, okay, so inner thigh is coming in here, something like this, coming around this way. What's going on on this side of the form? Well, same kind of idea, inner thigh, coming this way, actually crossing over that form, then coming down, down to the upper leg, down to the knee system, where things get a bit squarer, a little boxier. So I'm trying to think in those terms, and I find it's especially useful when you're starting out, think, what is it that I'm drawing? Joints, typically, elbows, wrists, ankles, knees, they tend to get boxier. They tend to get sharper, angles to them because obviously all of those joints are where bones come to the surface of the form. Something like a thigh is going to be a series of much softer forms, generally speaking, um, because obviously bone is not coming to the surface in those areas. 
So if I'm going through a checklist in my mind or just kind of thinking casually about what it is that I'm drawing, I can say to myself, okay, well now I've come down to the knee, I want to be a bit more mindful that things are getting a bit more angular. Whereas if I'm drawing the thigh, then I can think, okay, well things are going to be a little softer in this region. So now I'm going to come in, same thing, thinking, okay, thigh, coming up to the hips, now up here, something like that, coming up to the, the very upper part of the thigh. This is muscle here. Uh, and on this side is actually something called the tensor fascia latte, but you don't really need to concern yourselves at this point with the names, but just so you know. Coming up, okay, same, same drill. Oblique, rib cage. Now the breast coming in this way, something like this, coming in, doing something like that pectoral muscle cutting across this way, but then we're seeing the mass of the breast in here. Navel. Our collarbones. Neck. Okay, so trapezius coming down. It's actually a little bump here. It's part of the anatomy. Um, so look for it, locate it understand that it's there. So there's a lot of little subtleties like this where I'll add them at this stage, um, which is where having a knowledge of anatomy can help with this very subtle refinement stage where I really want to think about what is it that's going on with the anatomy? What is it that I want to understand? Okay, so the deltoids coming down this way, meeting up with the trapezius, uh, not the trapezius, sorry, the tricep coming down into the elbow system here, and then we can come down to um, the forearm on this side. Um, sometimes a very, very subtle fat pad sitting in this area here. Um, so I might want to, to indicate that. Coming down the bicep, coming down into the elbow, and once again, coming down into the forearm and into the hand here. And I can just con continue this kind of process as I go through the form. Come down here, calf muscle, coming down to the ankle, something like this, and so on. As you develop your skill set, you'll know where you can afford to take liberties right um, it's almost like you have to draw complicated before you can draw simple you know it's the same kind of with writing um, it takes quite a advanced level of writing skill to understand poetry and how to simplify everything down and I think the same applies to drawing so we kind of have to go through this stage of really kind of possibly over um, explaining everything before then we can find the simple statement, the simple idea of how you want to say something. Um, so I could go through, just finish all the, the little details here. Um, one last thing I'd like to just discuss um, today is because I've been thinking volumetrically, I can now start to light this form thinking in those terms. So for me to understand, for example, that light might be hitting here, but then as this form turns, there could very well be a, a core shadow here, same coming down the form here. And we could go in and we could start thinking, where is the form turning in space? Will give me a sense of um, where, my, where my form is in light and when it's in shadow. But we'll talk about that another day. Um, I just want to, before I go, I just want to talk about proportion quickly because it's not something that we've really discussed yet. Um, I think proportion, proportion is a, it's a tricky thing. One of the reasons being is you have 50 people in a room and no two people are going to um, have the exact same proportions. There are general ideas about proportion. Um, but even with that, depending on where you look in history, um, people had different ideas about the aesthetics of proportion or what was the ideal proportion. 
Um, so I'm a little reluctant to say this is the formula for proportion. You have to follow it every time because you may have the first model that comes in front of you, may have a longer torso or shorter legs than the proportion that we give. But let's just talk in generalities just for a minute. So we have our upper torso, our lower torso here. Let's just indicate where the head is. It's going to be somewhere in here, something like that. Um, let's just put some legs very loosely. One thing that you can look for, generally speaking, is from the top of the head to the pubic bone. If I go like this and I come down, well, that tells me where my legs are, which are right here. Halfway, <coughs> excuse me, between the top and the legs, halfway is the pubic bone. Um, if I go halfway between here and here, somewhere in here, this is actually probably just below the knee. So I'll just I'll put in my legs here. So my knee is probably going to be sitting right about here. And then obviously I can come in and I can talk about the lower leg down here. So top of the head, pubic bone, feet halfway. Um, something else you might find useful, let me just put in the arch of the rib cage again in here, something like that, is from the pit of the neck here, where the manubrium is, to the top of the arch of the rib cage, the little bone called the xiphoid process, to the navel, to the pubic bone. They are roughly evenly spaced. I think this one tends to be a little bit longer, but these three are essentially evenly spaced for the most part. So it's a, it's a point of measurement that you can use um, with a certain amount of confidence that it's going to get you at least in the, in the ballpark of what's right. Now, if I come to the navel here and I come out this way, this tells me approximately where the elbow is. So that's kind of useful. Coming down to below the pubic bone here, the wrist, and then the hand coming down here. Um, so this is something just to, to keep in mind as a very kind of rough idea with proportion. Proportion's tricky, and I know it's something a lot of people struggle with. Um, it takes practice, but I would say that if you follow the concept of uh, working with large ideas, what's the large idea, you know, that first stage of the drawing, go back and have a look at that. Um, get, try and you develop a sense, or you will develop a sense as time goes by, of what those proportions should be and whether you're in the right ballpark. And honestly, that just really comes through trial and, the trial and error. Um, you know, draw it wrong a couple of hundred times and you'll start to experiment on trying to find a solution for why, why it keeps going wrong. The other thing about proportion, though, that I just think you need to be mindful of, especially even thinking in these terms, is as soon as the model turns or goes into a pose that's foreshortened, all of these normal standing proportions obviously go out of the window. So proportion is, it's, there's no simple formula. If this model was turned like this, none of these relationships um, work anymore. And then you have to start thinking about perspective and foreshortening. And as I said, we'll talk about that um, at another time. So I hope this helps. Um, obviously, we've got a lot more to discuss. And as we move through the, um, the sessions, um, we'll start to add more complex ideas and we will start to develop a keener sense for anatomy and we'll discuss all of those things further. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you found this useful, um, please like and subscribe. It helps me out a great deal. And I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.